Thanks very much, everyone. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And I just want to say how thrilled I am to be joining you for this particular topic. I'm, I'm excited on a personal level and on a professional level to be talking about ideas which I think are really central to, to the way that the development sector works at the moment and the way the development sector should be working in the future. And I'm really looking forward to what I hope will be a fantastic day ahead today. And I'd really like to see this as a key event in this dialogue. This is central and critical challenge as Tony and Patrick and, and Greg have outlined. I'd really like us to be able to look back on today as a, as a really key dialogue in, in this process, um, a turning point in how we think about and operate in this space. I wanted to start by sharing a quote from the late great educationalist Lawrence Peter that I think is especially relevant today because of the humility that it highlights. He said, and I quote, some problems are so complex and uncertain that you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. <laughs> and I think in that light, I'd like to say something about how hard I've worked over the course of my career to be very undecided about all kinds of things. I have brought a complete sense of bafflement to physics and maths, to social anthropology. I brought confusion to business management, to finance, to ecology, to epidemiology. I've shared my lack of certainty when teaching programs on economics, on disease responses, on ecosystems, on organizational change, on knowledge management, and on strategy. And I guess this, this lifelong desire or this uncertainty is part of a lifelong desire to keep exploring and keep learning new disciplines. And in some settings, work settings, it's been a boon. In other settings, it's been a curse. Some have, Robert Chambers, who I now have the privilege and the pleasure of working near, um, describes me as a bit of an intellectual nomad, which is a very generous way of putting it. My wife's rather less charitable view when I tell her excitedly about a new textbook I've just devoured is, oh great, another subject for you to be boring and vague about. <laughs> Some people assume that have being a multidisciplinarian makes me very good at trivial pursuits. I get lots of requests to be on pub quiz teams. Unfortunately, I end up disappointing my colleagues on all of those. And I think one of, the, one of the things I perhaps have done, perhaps I haven't necessarily integrated these things, is combined them in a kind of ever-extending patchwork quilt. And that's, I guess, what I want to present to you today, a, something of a patchwork quilt, if you'll forgive me, um, uh, on the why, how, and what next of, of integrated development. And I'm going to start by talking about why we need it, especially in development but not exclusively in development, why we also need it in business, why we also need it in government, why we also need it in politics. Pretty much every field of human endeavor today needs some form of integration. And I want to talk about this in specific relation to one of the major challenges we've faced in the international development sector in recent years. And um, the major challenges we still face despite the challenges, despite our failures in taking an integrated approach. In the second part of my talk, I want to get a little bit more positive. I want to give you some examples of initiatives at different scales, at different states of progress, that have started to achieve integrated development or are starting to move forward towards them. And then I want to share some reflections on the kinds of principles that seem to be emerging about what can foster integrated development, building on the excellent work of Greg's team in the integrated development. If you haven't picked up the, the background material that's been produced, do so. Some of the work that I've been doing in my book in other settings as well. And then I want to close by arguing that the critical next step towards integrated development is actually to recast and re-envision our own role as development experts. And I'll, for those of you that know Robert Chambers, you'll know this isn't a new argument, but I want to kind of reframe it for what we're talking about today. And I'll share a number of scenarios for the future of integrated development and invite you to reflect on where you think we're heading, whether or not we're heading towards the future we all collectively desire, and if we are, great, and if not, what we might do about it. But I want to begin, very simply, with a picture of a tree. This tree may not look like much, and it's clearly seen better days, but one could make a pretty good case that this is perhaps the single most globally significant tree of recent years. Can anyone guess why? Sorry. 
So this tree's rather momentous importance stems from a seemingly inconsequential fact. It was the favorite play spot for a small boy called Emil Umanu and his friends. It was about 50 meters from his home on a well-walked path that the women from his village would walk along to a small river where they did their washing or en route into the forest where they would go to gather food. Emil spent a lot of time playing here with his friends while his mother washed or gathered fruit. And like many other two-year-olds, wherever they lived, he loved his balls, he loved playing with his friends. He was enthralled by technology. He loved listening to his parents' radio all the time. No one knows exactly when Emil got sick, but he did get sick, and it happened after a day of playing in the tree. He contracted a fever around Christmas Day 2013, which progressed to vomiting. He started passing blood, and he died on the 28th of December. He was soon followed by his sister, his grandmother, and his pregnant mother. Emile, as you've probably guessed by now, was the first patient, and this tree was ground zero for the West African Ebola outbreak. Now, Emile was identified in March 2014, one week after WHO stated that there was an outbreak, acknowledged there was an outbreak in Guinea. By a team of researchers from Germany, he traveled to find the source of the outbreak. They came to Emile's hometown in southern Guinea. They worked out that the tree was home to a colony of free-tailed bats that the children played with and hunted. At some point, the researchers worked out, Emile came into contact with one, an infected bat, either directly or through feces. What happened precisely will probably remain a mystery forever. Perhaps he crawled inside the hollow. Perhaps he found a bat on the ground there, weak and dead. Maybe he played with it and was bitten. Maybe he skewered it and roasted it over a fire and ate it, like many of these children do in this village. Perhaps he touched bat droppings with his hands and subsequently wiped it in his face. It's far too late for Emil, for his family, for many thousands of others across West Africa. But it actually is very important to ask, what could have been done? What could have been done to stop this outbreak at source? And it's not an academic or a theoretical question. It has the potential to directly influence how we prevent future crises. And it turns out there are lots of possible answers. And the answer you get depends on who you speak to. Let me give you a few. You could try and stop the children from playing in the forest. But where do you draw the line? The researchers identified that actually Emil was very unlucky to get infected. It was sheer bad luck. So do we stop all play of all children? What does that do to social capital? What does it do to relaxation? What does it do to ed education? Do all children have to stop playing, or just the poor ones who live on the verge of the forest? You could chop down the tree. Meliandu is in the Gueku district, which is known as the forest region of Guinea. Much of the surrounding forest area has been destroyed by mining and timber operations. In fact, 80% of the Guinean rainforest is now destroyed. This is precisely why people and bats are coming into ever closer contact. When trees disappear, when humans encroach on their ecosystems, diseases are one of the first things that happen. Bats typically start nesting in the eaves of houses and other buildings. So you can't chop down the tree. You could try and create firewalls between people and forests, but they rely on the forest for their livelihoods, for basic food security. At the time of the outbreak in December 2013, over 90% of the people in this region reported reducing the number of meals they eat in a single day. Almost 90% reported consuming less expensive food or less desirable food. And they got the food that they could rely on from the forest. Without the forest, without using the forest, they'll spiral into ever greater food insecurity. You could cull the bats. But bats support human livelihoods in many different ways. In fact, there are 300 different bat species in that part of Africa. That represents 20% of the mammalian biodiversity in Africa, in that part of Africa. And they contribute to forestry and to human livelihoods in all kinds of ways. Everyone talks about bees pollinating, but actually bats play a really central role in pollinating the flowers of trees. They aid reforestation by dispersing seeds. They consume agricultural pests. They reduce crop damage. They, they actually consume around a quarter of their body weight in insects in a day, including mosquitoes. So killing them would not be a solution, 
Ebola killed 2,500 people in Guinea over two, uh, 2014, but malaria killed almost 12,000 in that same time period. You kill the bats, you're almost certainly going to see a rise in malaria. You could try and screen people more regularly, go down the health systems approach. But actually, health systems, as we know now, are very weak in this region. Guinea has very low levels of health capacity, one health centre for every 24,000 people. Can you imagine that? Only one health worker for every 1,600 people. That's four times higher than the, the quantity the WHO recommends. The WHO recommends one per 400, which still seems slightly ludicrous. But... And actually, Guinea was the strongest of the three affected countries. In Meliandu, the village doctor was the, amongst the first to flee the virus. This is the clinic in Meliandu. It was shuttered and abandoned early in the outbreak. Community health workers were the only people that could have actually traced this. And according to colleagues of mine with the Red Cross, apparently there was an indication from community health workers around the time of December, January, December 2013, January 2014, that there were symptoms that were ongoing of the initial outbreak, but it was reported and analyzed as cholera because of the features that happened, and it wasn't followed up on. You could stop free movement with all of the knock-on implications for rights, for rural urban dynamics, for economics. So spikes in the, the, the prices of essential goods are just the very first thing that will happen. But as insecurity rises because people get angry, the army gets called in to keep the peace, trust starts to spiral, it starts to run at fever pitch, and this is to say nothing about the broader impact on trade, on agriculture. All of this leads to a spiraling impoverishment of rural people. And such measures are actually counterproductive. When measures that respond to diseases affect people's livelihoods, it's ever more likely, all the evidence shows us, that new and emerging cases go unreported. So this leaves the disease to carry on unchecked. And the reason I want to share this is I think this actually highlights the challenges we face in integrated development. And these examples highlight this famous quote from H.L. Mencken, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. Or in the case of Ebola, many solutions that are simple, easy, and wrong. A wildfire analogy is often used by epidemiologists to describe disease spread. In, in the case of Ebola, applying narrow, siloed approaches was akin to trying to put out the flames of Ebola by pouring petrol on them. And these examples of what could have been done and what some senses were being done can actually help to clarify exactly why Ebola is such a problem, was such a problem for the international community. Now, there are many issues for us to focus on when it comes to Ebola, from healthcare capacities to the non-existent investments in early warning through to the institutional politics of reporting on epidemics. But even if all these fundamental challenges have been addressed, even if there were strong health systems, Ebola may have still slipped through the net. It may have still slipped to our ascension because it wasn't the result of an environmental crisis. It wasn't the result of a food security crisis. It wasn't the result of a livelihoods crisis. It wasn't an economic crisis, and it wasn't a health crisis. It was all of these things at the same time. And as such, it sat in between many different sectors, many different disciplines, many different endeavors, but wasn't the focus of any of them. It slipped through the cracks and the gaps in our matrix management structures, in our sectoral divisions, and in our silos. And we didn't make the connections until it was far too late. We didn't understand. In fact, you could probably argue that some of our jobs relied on us not understanding this stuff. And this, in, at least in part, is why the review that was recently undertaken, published late last year by Harvard and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, described Ebola as a catastrophic failure of collect collective action at all levels. We failed to anticipate, we failed to act, we failed to think together, and the poorest and most vulnerable in one of the most devastated areas in the world paid the harshest price. The head of UNISDR, Robert Glasser, said earlier on this year, Ebola underpins why it's so important to break down silos in disaster management and development. And I think it's here that we can start to see how we might prevent Ebola in the future. How might we have prevented Emil from falling sick? It's by working across these silos in an intelligent fashion through integrated reflection, through integrated action, through integrated programs that combine environmental, epidemiological, virological, veterinary, social, developmental approaches with local knowledge. That's the best way to prevent crises like Ebola in the future. 
Now, it probably seems like an extreme case, and I can sense by the energy in the room that there's a, there's a, there's a kind of, sh uh, not an exact, a sober feeling around this, but actually, I think it's the, the reason why I want to share this is that it's the best illustration I can share of why integrated development matters. And it would seem worth asking, given that our sectors are actually being highlighted, our expert disciplines, the things that we are focused on delivering, as problematic, what's going on here? What is it about sectoral delivery that meant that we Ebola slipped through the cracks? Well, let's think about disciplines. Let's think about sectors for a second. What do they do? They help us tidy up the world. They help classify and organize our work, our thinking, our programs, our institutions. They encourage norms. They encourage collegiality. They encourage and support professional development. They underpin accountability. They promise efficiency. They give us channels and pathways for learning, for career development. The whole point of having sectors, the whole point of having disciplines, is it helps us master problems. But what in fact ends up happening is that our silos end up mastering us. And when this happens, it causes all kinds of damage. It leads to conflict between silos, struggles. It leads to isolated departments that fail to communicate. It leads to bottlenecks for information and innovation. Most importantly, it leads to narrow, tunnel vision, mental blind spots that lead us to do inappropriate or sometimes completely stupid things in the name of simplicity. And it can lead to failure to see systemic risks with the catastrophic consequences as I've just described. Now development is far from being the only place where you'll see these things. Just three examples. The New York emergency response teams the fundamental silos that existed there, when emergency workers rushed to the World Trade Center on 9-11, the walkie-talkies used by the fire, police, and health departments couldn't tune into the same communications channels. This was never noticed before because the teams were historically so disconnected. They only identified it on the day itself. It's been addressed now. Financial silos between retail and investment banks Everyone talks about separating Main Street from Wall Street. Actually, they're too separate. And this meant that missold mortgages at the lower end of the American market could bring the entire global economy to its knees. And the reverberations continue to this day. Silos between the response to the economic crisis that we saw in 2008 and the political implications of that. We saw the Arab Spring. But actually, one of the things that I think is really especially relevant today is the, the level of unrest that it's caused in developed countries. Greece is one of the cases that's especially pertinent. The world's longest-running monetary crisis is what Greece is undergoing. And it's turned into a crisis of democracy in the cradle of democracy. And the knock-on implications for the whole European project are very stark at the moment, with the UK about to go into polling on leaving the EU. The deeper problems that we face around the world are so tightly integrated that there's an ever-present threat of contagion, of cascading crises. It's the defining feature of our times, according to Christine Lagarde of the IMF. It's what I've called in my book an engine for perpetual crisis. But paradoxically, our lives and our institutions remain fragmented and divided. We spend our lives, whether it's online or offline, in ghettos of people that are like us whether it's professionally, whether it's politically, whether it's about race, whether it's about disciplines, whether it's about sectors. And when it comes to integration, we're increasingly applying a catastrophe-first model of lesson learning, just like the development sector did with Ebola. We only seem to realize we have to be more integrated when it's too late. This isn't the butterfly effect. This is what has been called the but butterfly defect. But thankfully, these problems are neither inevitable nor unavoidable. And I want to move on to talk about a number of initiatives that are at different stages of development that have managed to be more proactively integrated, that have managed to work across silos rather than be mastered by them. Now, this is just based on my perspectives, and I want to draw across a few things that I think are particularly compelling. And I know there are a lot more out there, and I know we'll be hearing more of them over the course of today. So let me start with disease. A great example of integrated uh, thinking and action is the work of a project in Kenya in the Mwea region. Now, Mwea is especially prone to malaria because it's an important rice growing region, and large paddies provide an ideal breeding ground, as we know, for mosquitoes. And the application of anti malarial drugs and insecticides has been widespread, 
but there's been a marked rise in resistance, both amongst mosquitoes and the parasites themselves. Some years ago, a multidisciplinary team developed and launched a project to try and look at health in a more dynamic and systemic perspective. They started off by employing and training local researchers from the community, whose first task was to go to the village themselves, instead of having an international team going there, go to the village themselves and conduct village interviews across their, 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 their kind of fellow villagers in the region to give a, to a first ground level view of the malaria system from the perspective of those most affected. And the factors they identified were dizzyingly large. History, social background, political conflicts. It, a subsequent evaluation described this as an admirable feat of analysis. And they undertook a systems analysis approach, which essentially placed malaria in this wider social ecological context. It's part of what I've represented here. And the approach was a little bit like taking a camera and using a wide zoom lens. Essentially, you, you scan back. First of all, you see a, a mosquito inf infecting a person. And that's where most interventions focus on. In fact, there's been a lot of, uh, lot of lot talking about why do, why do we only look at that, that particular point? Surely it's too late when it's a mosquito that's biting someone. Pull the lens back. Look at poverty in the village. Pull the lens back. Look at farming practices. Pull the lens back. This wide-angle lens enabled the local researchers to determine, determine the re reasons behind malaria and to develop integrated approaches. What was particularly noteworthy was a, was a post-colonial resistance movement, which they would never have identified otherwise. Basically, at the end of the colonial period, when the Brits left, farmers decided to take back local control over irrigation systems. It was a system of government that was, that was associated with enduring impoverishment. And basically, the, the, the Brits said, plant, everyone should plant at the same time at a particular time, particular season. And the farmer said, no, we don't want to do that anymore. That's a symbol of what the Brits left us. But actually, what that meant was, instead of planting at particular times when malaria could be diminished, you had waterlogged fields all year round. Agricultural chaos ensued. It pushed up both the po mosquito population and the malaria population. So there's a whole range of different approaches that were developed and used. We saw a shift away from these standard medicalized re responses. So for example, coordination of the farmers meant reduction of the paddy, paddy flooding to, uh, time. Rice planting was, was alternated with soya, a dry crop, and it both reduced the mosquito population and it improved the villagers' diets. Uh, maintaining cattle as bait, introducing naturally occurring bacteria into water to kill mosquitoes, planting mosquito-repelling plants, ensuring vulnerable groups like children and women always used bed nets at night, making sure that they didn't go out at times when they would be prone. A subsequent assessment of this approach found that the case of the malaria had steadily declined to less than 10 to 40 percent of all cases at the start of the project, to less than 10 and then zero. And the biggest single element was this integrated approach, this integrated environmental medical approach to dealing with it. And this is now being disseminated more widely across the country with the goal of finding more systemic ways of reducing that malaria whilst improving health and meeting the sweet spot of enhancing nutrition. Let me, let me move on, having mentioned nutrition, to, to malnutrition treatments. So severe acute malnutrition affects between 12 and 17 million children worldwide. It has long-term effects, stunting, it can lead to long-term brain damage. Um, it's a really per, per, pernicious problem. And I want to tell you about the work of a, a good colleague and friend of mine called Steve Collins, who's done a huge amount to bring a more integrated approach to malnutrition. In the late 1990s, Steve was working in Liberia, and he was running a nutrition program. And he was considered, even though he was only in his only 30s, one of the foremost nutritionists in the world. So he knew what to do. He was an expert in tackling malnutrition using these kind of therapeutic feeding tents, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of from times in the field. These are large centers where malnourished people were admitted, usually children, for an average around 30 days. In Somalia in 1992, Steve oversaw the first adult feeding centers anywhere since the Second World War. And he published the, uh, his work in the prestigious na journal Nature. But when he was in Liberia in 1996, there was a cholera outbreak. And it, and it led to a lot of people who'd gathered and a lot of the people in the feeding centers that he was running to, to contract cholera and die. And it challenged him to rethink this way of working. He said later, it brought home to me that the danger of bringing people together in feeding centers was too narrow an approach. 
There has to be a better way, I thought. I knew this would come from engaging with people better, looking at their full range of strengths rather than simply trying to impose narrow solutions onto them. And that's exactly what he did. He used new nutritional products. As many of you will know of Plumpy Nut, that was just one of the ones that he used. But Plumpy Nut was the hardware. Steve developed the software by which it could be used. It was a new way of treating malnutrition that was five times more effective than conventional methods. Even today, malnutrition rates for um, mortality rates for children that get severe acute malnutrition runs at between 30 to 50 percent in these feeding tents. With, with community-based feeding therapy, it's between 5 to 10 percent. And it's, it was approved by the WHO as the forefront of efforts to tackle malnutrition. And it was essentially what he had to do was to tackle the old expert knowledge base that said, bring your starving children to our hospital. Our nurses will take care of the problem. This narrow, siloed, medicalized approach. It required new products from the private sector, but it was also about a more empowering community-based approach to healthcare. And you've got to try and imagine the situation he was in when people were throwing abuse at him. It's major international conferences where one of the most learned nutritionists in the world stood up and said, you're killing children with this approach. In fact, when the first studies were analysed, it was found that 95% of the subjects who, went, who had treatment at home had a full recovery, a rate far better than the hospitals. And this has actually led to a major change, but actually the integration is, doesn't stop there. It's not just about community capability in healthcare. Ready-to-use therapeutic foods are based on peanuts, and most of the world's peanuts are obviously grown in developing countries. Steve's also developed a novel approach by which to develop these therapeutic foods in developing countries. So you get a local source for these foods. It, it frees the initiatives from de dependency on imports from Europe and from the West. Local production improves livelihoods by creating jobs. Many organizations around the world are linking to local farmers in order to provide a more consistent source of income, creating agricultural demand, strengthening local markets, creating jobs. It's a real sweet spot of how the front line of humanitarian work done in an integrated way can lead to more sustainable development. The third case is a, a, a more recent case. It's around clean energy. Currently, 1.3 billion people around the world remain without access to electricity. Many of these live in remote rural communities, and they urgently need services, energy services, in order to see development progress. Now, between 1990 and 2010, 1 1.7 billion people gained access to electricity. But the rate of gain barely outpaced population growth, and it disproportionately benefited people in urban settings. The Africa Progress Report estimates that the investment of 55 billion per year is needed until 2030 to meet demand and achieve universal access to electricity. But it's not just the money, it's also how it's done that's important. And in particular, it's the growing effort in renewable, decentralized energy systems. It's becoming apparent that small-scale, off-grid solar power systems have great potential to leapfrog investments in large-scale infrastructure. One of the most prominent systems of recent years is M Copper, which I'm sure many of you know about. It was founded in Kenya in 2011. And essentially, it's an asset-based financing company that provides battery-based solar power to off-grid households. And it was based on the finding that the average off-grid Kenyan household, living on $2 a day, spent up to $200 a year on kerosene and other energy sources. And the customers through this system, instead of paying that, actually pay a smaller amount over a course of a day, using an annual pay-as-you-go system, operationalized by the M-Pesa mobile money system, you get an initial deposit, then you have daily payments for a course of a year, by which point you own the system outright. And the daily payment was lower than the cost of kerosene, which has made the switch really easy, and the use of M-Pesa made it very familiar and simple. And now MCOP has expanded across a number of African countries, an analysis has shown it wasn't the technology that was the biggest barrier, it was the access to finance. So energy can't be solved without understanding financial inclusion, and it's bringing these things together. And providers can both enable and disable systems using the mobile phones. So communications and technology plays a really central part as well. And this is becoming the fastest growing electricity segment in Africa, in just in the last few years. So over time, providers of this system can provide, they can use payment history, they can provide additional financial services. And actually, some of the companies that start off as retailers of energy systems have diversified into a much broader range of efforts. And the, the 
precise tool that's provided by NCOPPER can actually be used in a whole range of other assets. So we've been talking about clean stoves since God knows when. It can help deal with clean stoves. It can deal with access to sanitation, health, basic services. There are massive implications for locally financed development. So what I hope is that from these case studies, as well as the failure of Ebola that I outlined earlier, is that not only is integrated development the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. But how do we actually do it? I've given a few illustrations. The key, and I think this is a fundamental thing, which Greg's team and Patrick at Dorsa's Auto talks about this, um, the key is evidence-based learning. Now, if you haven't picked them up yet, these two reports, the review of the evidence which looks at the integration of global health, the resource pack, I do urge you to do that. And I think we should be grateful for, to FHI for their work, not just in this, these reports, but the, the networks and the support, the advocacy they've been doing around this issue. And I think one of the findings FHI has been able to share with us is that it's actually much easier to say what should be done rather than how to do it. There's no best practice. There's no template. Uh, when it comes to repeating the trick, if you like, we know it can work in some settings, so how do we repeat the trick? So I think the first step, and FHI are leading the way here, is to learn, learn, and learn. I think we, we know there are many documented examples out there um, than we're actually using. I think we need to tap into them better, and we need to try and draw out those evidence and shed light on the collective lessons. But there are also some emerging principles I want to share with you, and I'm sharing them not as a, a kind of template, but as a as a preliminary form for discussion, debate, and, and dissent. The first thing I think we need to do, like Steve did, like, like I hope I did with the Ebola case, is to ask difficult questions and actually listen to the answers. And these questions have to be designed in order to unify people. They need to be challenging questions that sit above our matrices, that sit above our sectors. So there has to be a web way of dealing with malnutrition that doesn't risk harming people. There has to be a way of meeting energy needs in a financially sustainable way. And we need the institutional openness to hear the answers, even if it's inconvenient professionally or politically or, or organizationally, actually especially if it's inconvenient. And we need to regularly question the matrices that we use. We shouldn't be mastered by these disciplines. We should master them. The second thing is we need to span boundaries. Uh, we can do this through good fortune, probably as, as happens now, but where two, two people might collide with each other in a, in a corridor or in a, in a field setting. But actually, we need to do this in a more structured and organized way. We need to mix it up. Um, we need to build shared assets uh, for communication, for joint planning, for negotiation, and the, between people that are typically very separated. Some of these can be very formal, structured, mechanisms. Something can be rather simpler means of managing serendipity. My favorite kind is from Nesta. I don't know if any of you know Nesta, the National Endowment of Science, Technology, and the Arts. Uh, it's the UK Foundation for Innovation, and I'm a fellow of it. And they've developed this thing called the RCT. It's actually my favorite kind of RCT. Not a randomized control trial, a randomized coffee trial. <laughs> so randomized con coffee trials commit you to meeting another member of staff for coffee once a week. You're randomly assigned through a little app who you're going to have coffee with from amongst those that made the commitment. When they launched it, 50% of people signed up straight away, and then, and then another 30% signed up within the next few months. You're not obliged to talk to anyone at all uh, about anything in particular, but you have to make the date. You have to commit to it. And what it does is it provides legitimacy to talk to people about a whole range of things. It might be work-related, it might be social. And although there haven't always been direct beneficial impacts on programs, actually it broadens the networks. But actually, these totally random conversations are what helps break silos in a very simple and very effective way. It's a really good way of revealing the linkages that need to happen and encouraging people to collaborate. And it's really interesting that being part of this wider RCD banner gives permission to spend and honor the time. So people report that they're less likely to cancel a meeting if it's an RCT compared to an actual social catch up on a busy day. And I think this, uh, there's something here, you know, uh, uh, when we're talking about spanning boundaries, yes, let's be good at it, let's be professional, but let's also not go for perfection, let's dabble, let's, let's go for a messy meeting of minds. We need to build empathy. FHI talks about the 
the science of improving human lives. And I think that is really important. I've written about the importance of science. But I think, and I, I'd be the first to admit this, sometimes you can forget about the art of transformation when you focus on the science of delivery. Sometimes we don't empathize with each other um, uh, within our own organizations, and we need to connect better. Sometimes, actually, we're shockingly hostile to each other, work which I've done in conflict settings. The development actors and humanitarian actors are obviously annoyed and upset about the government, about the intransigence, about, about, about people that are perpetuating the conflict, but they reserve some of their harshest criticisms for the other side of the aid system. And, and this is, you know, or agriculture specialists that go up against health specialists, or water and sanitation specialists spend all their time complaining about shelter. And this dysfunctional sibling rivalry needs to be broken down. I think it's really important for us to grow up a little, to be honest. And so there are language barriers, there are cultural barriers. We need translators and facilitators. We're not everyone's going to be able to speak the language of all the different parts. But there are estimates in the private sector. You need 10% of people that are able to deal with one or more, or more than one sector. And that, those people can be really important in helping transmit ideas. Transmitting ideas helps understanding each other. Understanding each other leads to mutual respect. Respect leads to empathy. And I believe you cannot have genuine integration without empathy. And I think if you look at MCOPA, the, the way in which the energy specialists, the mobile money specialists, and the finance specialists came together to try and work this all out, it required an understanding of each other's limitations and their capabilities before they could really develop a solution. Strength and incentives. Now, how many of you work in an open plan office? Hands up. No. An open plan office. Uh, how many of you have found that it's changed the way that you talk about or deal with your organisa organisational culture? Oh, okay. Interesting. I guess my, my inexperience is that open plan offices are, can, can lead to... If you don't change the culture, no amount of open plan will actually lead to integration. It can lead to some integration, but um, I think we need to tackle the, the underlying incentives which lead us to the, the as, as um, Tony was saying earlier on. And this means thinking about the hard and the soft incentives. Uh, in, in the development sector, especially, there's a kind of you eat what you catch kind of mentality. So people tend to focus on financial incentives that are very much within their program. And this means that there, there's no fundamental incentive for people to break out of them. But there's also increasingly people talking about bottom line savings through integration, that you can get cost savings. And I think that's absolutely, I can understand where it comes from. But if you focus on cost savings, you're not going to get, you're going to go, it's going to be a race to the bottom. It's far better to look at the top line than the bottom line. Not the cost saves, but the value added. How do, not, how do we not get better value for money? How do we transform our effectiveness? And I don't think we're thinking about that enough. I think we may see the accounting needs when we look for value for money, but we miss the development opportunities. And we need to, we need to understand these systems throughout the system. So how do you bring donors on board? for example, is a question that many people talk about. Actually, all the approaches I've been talking about, they went against the grain initially. They got finance from unconventional donors and then to make the case, and then they brought in the big donors once they'd made the case. And then they can convince people of the need for investment. I think the final point, and this is really, I have to take my hat off to FHI for really highlighting this, integrate where it most matters and remember who we serve. Um, and I want to quote from the background paper. Decades ago, we organized the global development architecture into silos because it suited our needs. It was more convenient. It was easier to track and report progress. We have divided people into parts, but to them, holistic approaches that reflect the complexity of their lives make much more sense. And I think that's really important. Think about the Moya case, the malaria case I talked about earlier, using local researchers to build up a picture before designing the package. This is where integration has the most effect, and this is where it should start in the lives of those that we are serving, and we should never forget that. So let me try and, so those principles, having shared that, let me try and quickly sum up where I think we are. So we're facing an ever greater need to integrate, but we're finding it ever harder. There's some great examples to learn from, as well as some failures that we need to be really careful to pay attention to. We need to learn better about both. And there are some key principles that are emerging about how we can confirm, learn, develop, and apply these in practice. So I want to close by leaving you with two thoughts. The first is 
that there are a whole set of personal and professional and political institutional issues which need to be in place. But I think it starts with us. I think it's silos that we operate with are fundamentally about expertise and capacity and credibility. And in integrating across them means challenging expertise and capacity. And we have to really understand what this means. And I've shared some thoughts here. But overall, expertise cannot be closed. It has to be open. It can't be about formal positions. It has to be about activities and behaviours. Expertise can't flow from us down. It has to flow in lots of different directions. It, it's not just an individual quality. It's got to be, we've got to find expert groups. It's not about finding known paths to predetermined outcomes. It's about being able to engage with unknown patterns and exploring them to emergent patterns. It's not about certainty and direction and control and coordination. It's about uncertainty. It's about listening. It's about adaptation and collaboration. It's not about fixing by delivering answers. It's about enabling learning and innovation by learning the right questions. And although we tend to be incentivized towards these large strategic investments, integrated development may well call for many parallel experiments to be tried all at the same time. Patrick Fine and I were talking about exactly this set of issues in the build-up of the event, and one of the things we agreed on, we both disliked this idea that we should be working ourselves out of a job. But we actually agreed that what we should be trying to do is constantly try and work ourselves into new jobs and never stop doing that. And that, I think, is the real key to this. And I wonder if we're ready to do that. I wonder what we can all individually do to do that. The second point is around the time frame. One of the benefits of silos is that they prevent us... There's a short-term efficiency gain to silos, and that can, as again, to quote Patrick, lean to long-term irrelevance, leads to missed risks and opportunities. What I've done is I've borrowed from some existing scenario models and to try and share where I think the future of integrated development might be. The first scenario <laughs> is the ostrich. We bury our heads in the sand. We ignore the ever-growing integration of the world. We become prone to the butterfly defect. And the world carries on without us. We become, I think, irrelevant in this situation. The second situation, the lame duck. We do it, but we don't use evidence. We don't learn. We don't engage with communities. It becomes a fad. It hobbles along uh, for a short time period and then it gets gobbled up by some hungry predator. The Icarus approach, we do it, but we don't give up on our sources of expertise. We aren't, we aren't willing to challenge our own expertise and our own capabilities. We don't gr ground our approaches in the lives of others. We're too proud, and so we p pursue unsustainable ideas. We, we hide our interests in our back pocket whilst paying lip service to integration. And like Icarus, we fly close to, too close to the sun, our wings melt, and we collapse. And the final scenario is the flight of flamingos. We move forward together, collectively, maybe slowly, but openly, in an inclusive and collective fashion, learning together and moving forward together. Which scenario do you think we're in? I think the jury's still out. The SDGs, for example, have paid lip service or some attention to the idea of integration. But I want to see if this actually gets operationalized. I was saying to Patrick and, and, and Greg earlier on, in, in the way in which these targets are getting operationalized, it's not really MDG 2.0 or 3.0, it's MDG 1.1. Um, so I, I want to pose this question to you over the course of today. Which scenario matches where we are today? Is it optimal? Do we need to change and how? I want to close with this final thought. It's well known, but I think it's especially appropriate for us in this setting. And it's the word disenthralled that stands out for me. And if nothing else, if you don't remember anything else from my talk, I want you to remember the word disenthralled. Because I think it's fundamental to what we need to do. We need to disenthrall ourselves, stop being so hypnotized by our own expertise. We need to move beyond the biases and the limitations of our current thinking. We need to be open to questioning ourselves, each other, to interrogate what it is we're really trying to do and how we're trying to do it. We have to be free to see the world as it really is. And we have to have the courage and the humility to think and act accordingly. Thank you very much for listening.
So this is a question I want to put to you as we go into the Q&A session, um, and also as we go over the course. Which of these scenarios do you think best describes us? Do we need to change, and if so, how? So, Ben, you have some time for Q&A? I think so. How long do I talk for? Is that too long? No, we want the Q&A. We want the Q&A. Okay. So I'll just introduce myself, Ben, and then I'll moderate that for you. So I'm Leith Greenslade. I'm very delighted to be moderating the rest of the program. Ben, that was fantastic. I'm remembering wide-angled lens. That, for me, was that's what I want to have, a wide-angled lens. But questions for Ben. Please raise your hand and state uh, your name and the organisation that you represent before you ask the question. Thank you. But can I also urge you, along with your question, to say where you think we are and where we need to get to? Hello. Uh, my name is Laura Ahern. I'm a AAAS fellow from the uh, from USAID. Um, so where I think we are, I think it depends on who we are. What do you mean by we? Okay, because I think we um, are in different places at different moments, and different ones of us are um, different kinds of birds. Um, my question is: uh, You mentioned all of the different disciplines um, and areas where you have been um, uh, uncertain. And uh, one of those was social anthropology. I'm an, I'm an anthropologist, linguistic and cultural. And I wonder whether you can share with us maybe some of the things you learned from that field and talk a little bit about maybe where you think some of those perspectives or methods might help us in this next stage? Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think, I think there's two answers to that. The, the first is, obviously, anthropologists, by dint to their very nature, that they, they, they are focused on understanding. Understanding the things, the symbols, the underlying pictures, the underlying principles by which we operate, and asking questions. Uh, the ethnographic method itself is a really powerful one to get to the bottom of some of the, the kind of the reasons why people do things. And I, uh, one of the reasons I loved going to anthropology lectures was I would go in and the world would look the same and I'd come out and it just, everything was full of significance and meaning and, and relevance. And I think that the value of anthropology, certainly as I've practiced it in our settings, is twofold. One is asking better questions about the, work, the settings that we live in uh, the, and work in. Um, not, not, not just out, out there, if you like, in development settings, but actually an anthropology of of expertise, an anthropology of how we organize ourselves. What is it we're really trying to get to? And, and there have been a few anthropological assessments that have been done, far more actually in the private sector because they've got the resources to do it. But some people like David Moss and others, have, uh, Ros Aben, Marilyn, Marilyn Strathern, they've looked at this issue of, of, of the culture of aid and how it influences the way we do things. And I think that's something we need to get better at. And um, I think we can get better at it. We, we should have in-house anthropologists, potentially. Or we should all have the skills to be able to ask those questions of ourselves and, uh, and of each other. I think the second thing is understand that using anthropology more frequently when we're looking at that point that I made about the integration of people's lives. Um, when you talk to people about the challenges they face, they don't divide them all up into, into nice, neat silos. They talk about them as integrated wholes. Anthropology can help us understand that reality and, and, and respect that reality. I think there's something about mutuality within anthropology that's really important. It's all too often missing, or it gets instrumentalized, instrumentalized within the aid system. So I think there's real value of it at that level as well. I, th I think perhaps more just as important, anthropology is grounded in a kind of sense of history, of a, of a culture that's ongoing, uh, and, and it's something that we're very, we're very sh short-termist in the way that we look back, you know, two, three, anything beyond two, three years, and it's, it's really problematic, and I think anthropology could perhaps help us there as well. Another question? Yes, this lady here. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, Kathy Pack with MSI Tetra Tech. Um, my question is, I've noticed that um, one of the obstacles of um, integration and collaboration and perhaps maybe even innovation 
is um, the big elephant in the room, which is uh, many times funding. And I was wondering if you had any good examples or approaches to how, um, how you tackle funding um, when you're collaborating. Yeah, that's, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Interestingly, I think many of the really radical things which um, have come about haven't come about because they've had large amounts of funding uh, from the outset. And I think there's, a, there's almost like a catch-22. You ask for integrated development, the funding will end up asking you to split it all up into nice, neat uh, silos. And so you end up not having integrated development if you get a large amount of money. Uh, so I think, as I said, the, the way to do it is to do it by stealth. Look to non-traditional sources of funding. Look to, look to ways of, of, of um, representing the silos on one level whilst actually working in integrated fashion at, at another level. All of the initiatives that we talk, I've talked about haven't started off by getting large amounts of funding. They start off small, experimenting, and then when they've been successful, they've, they've got more and more resources, more and more support. And I think that, that, that in itself actually is part of the clue. It's, it's not about showing me the money, it's about showing me the knowledge. And I think in this setting, the willingness and the understanding and the knowledge is far more important than the money at the outset. So we have time for one more question of Ben. There's a gentleman at the back. Yes, thank you. Hello, uh, good morning. John Johnson from Chemonix. I think we're between an ostrich and a lame duck. Um, my, uh, my question is, you, you mentioned that bringing this about, uh, structural changes within development agencies are crucial, which I completely agree with. One of the points is that it seems that the private sector has some built-in incentives because this stuff works. It, it, the bottom line is, is more successful business, making more money. The, the Kenya example of electricity made that really, really clear. This, is, this really helped their bottom line, ultimately. And another good point was the, 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 question, the focus on meeting the needs of those whom we serve. But back, just looking at the public sector, anything else, any other particular examples of, of how it's worked well and where it's worked well in the public sector, this integration? Um, the first point, I guess I would just want to nudge back a little bit, is I, th I think this, is, this isn't, the private sector finds it challenging as well. They may have more motivation to break down the silos because they've got a, they, can, they can generate profits. They've got more investment uh, or more interest in actually trying to work out the, the solution to the problem. But it, even in the private sector, it can take time. Um, if you look at mobile phones, for example, it was a combination of two different technologies, radios and telephony. And it took 20 or 30 years for people to knock together, those different kinds of engineers, to knock together and work out a way of developing a mobile phone that worked. And that's what took us to the 1980s. Um, the Dutch government's a really interesting example because they see themselves as very progressive. And they, there's a particular story I heard about recently where they have a lot of... Um, it's very flat. Um, the only things that they tend to have in the landscape that protrude from the, the, the existing contours are dikes. And so they try to get a mechanism whereby, or a system by which they could put wind windmills for generating electricity on top of dikes. It took them 15 years to work out how to do it, to get these two vertical departments to coordinate with each other. So I think that there, are, there are no quick fixes, uh, I don't think, in the private sector or the public sector. I think, I think the, the key thing, I guess, it, just to reiterate, um, that there's, a, there's a lot of case studies and I can, I can share some particular references. The key thing is that you've got to have the leadership and the, the incentives. You've got to have a rationale for doing it from the outset that's got to be core to your business. If you don't have that, and particularly this is the case in government, you need to find ways of developing mechanisms for integration that are of the system but not in the system. So the, the famous skunk works, which was developed by Lockheed Martins, which, which many of you all know about, is essentially a, a hidden approach to try and develop a not known to the rest of the organization, to try and develop a rocket during the Second World War. That's now become popular more widely. And increasingly in the public sector, you need to find spaces which are free of the, uh, not, not, not islands, but peninsulas, which are free from the, the main body, the main kind of land mass. There's an interesting analogy that Siemens uses. They say that we have a mothership which is moving forward, but some of our most strategic innovations and our collaborations happen on tug ships that we, we allow to 
orbit us, but we don't allow to be infiltrated or polluted by our culture until they've got the right kinds of answers. And I think that's actually particularly relevant the way we work in aid. We need to, we need to create the space, we need to maintain it, we need to protect it. Um, block tackle is a, is a particular analogy which my American friends like to use in this setting. So in American football, you're not the person with the ball if you're a block tackler. You're the person that stops anyone else getting the person with the ball. And we need more of those kinds of people to play that kind of defensive role. Ben, thank you so much. If we could all give another round of applause for Ben. <laughs>